That's right, Phil. The governor has just arrived here at the State uh, Museum Auditorium, and he's walking into the room right now, standing ovation, although we were told by one aide in this speech uh, not to look for a lot of applause. Uh, that was a to interrupt his comments today. That comes, of course, with a budget uh, that's about 12, little over $12 billion. A 1.8% increase over last year's spending. Not that much uh, that he's going to give them to clap for today, except for saving some money. Uh, he is going to propose, however, as we told you a little earlier, a uh, $310 million property relief, relief plan. And uh, so we'll see how that goes over. Senator Russo, Senate President, introducing Governor Kane here. Let's go up on stage for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, the governor of the state of New Jersey, the Honorable Thomas H. Kane. Thank you, Senate President John Russo and Speaker Chuck Hardwick. Uh, Speaker, either you or the Senate President left your gavel behind. I don't know what to <laughs> use it for, but while preparing this budget, I found myself returning to my days as a, as a high school teacher. And I remember spending several weeks on the Iliad. And in that great epic poem, Homer defines wisdom as the ability to read or write the present and to move with the occasion. Homo was describing a virtue that was precarious, elusive, and rare, centuries before Christ's birth, and remains precarious, elusive, and rare today. Yet this virtue, this ability to understand today and yet to plan for tomorrow, is precisely what's required of us whenever you and I invest the people's money. When I first stood before you, seven years ago now, we read or write the present, and we did it together, as Homer demands. But what we read at that time seven years ago was a blueprint for financial and economic disaster, reeling from the deepest recession since the Great Depression, we inherited a state budget with more red ink than one of my grade school spelling papers. In relative terms, our budget deficit was almost the same size as the deficit our federal government faces today. As a state, we were just holding on by our fingernails. We were like the, the fellow who was walking out on the Appalachian Trail along the Kittatinny Ridge and he was walking along the edge, and it was cold and wet, and he slipped. And he fell over the side of the cliff. Just as he was plunging downward, he reached out and he grabbed a branch in desperation. And there he hung, knowing that if he ever slipped or let go, he plunged down onto the rocks below. So he started yelling, help, help, is, is anybody there? And his words echoed, and there was absolutely no answer. So he began to pray. And then he yelled again, is anybody there? And all of a sudden, a loud voice from above answered, my son, I am here. Well, I looked up sort of in amazement to the top of the cliff, and he said, is that you? Is, 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 that, is that you, Lord? Yes, came the reply. And he said, well, well, what should I do? And the voice replied, do you have faith? The fellow said, yes. And the Lord replied, then let go of the branch. Well, the fellow looked down at the rocks 100 feet below, and he looked back and said, is there anyone else up there? <laughs> now, that's the way things used to be. But in 1982, working together, we had faith, and we did something different. We let New Jerseyans grab onto that future. We closed our budget deficit. And we did it, by the way, without decimating the 
long-term investments that were eventually to turn New Jersey around from economic laggard to leader. Once the fiscal crisis is behind us, we hastened our economic renewal by toppling the roadblocks that had brought business to a screeching halt at our very borders. Together, we eliminated the corporate net worth tax. We phased out the inheritance tax and gave struggling young companies a tax break. We cut taxes in our inner cities, and we paid back an unemployment insurance debt that was an albatross around the neck of wage earner and wage payer alike. Two and a half billion dollars in tax cuts over four years. It's a great deal of money. It averages about $780 for every taxpayer. We return together that $780 to New Jerseyans because we believe that they can spend it better than we could spend it here in Trenton. You know, an economist has been defined as someone who could accurately predict the distant past. But no one could have predicted what happened to New Jersey in the 1980s. Who predicted that a state which had trailed the region in job growth for decades would become the region's leader? Who predicted that our personal income would soar to the second highest in the entire United States? And who predicted that our unemployment rate would sink to the lowest in the entire nation, lower than California, lower than New York, and yes, a good many times, even lower than that miracle state of Massachusetts. <laughs> what happened was disarmingly simple. As state taxes went down, state revenues went up. We were able to do something that government in this state has rarely done before. With good leadership, the leadership of our Senate President John Russo and our Speaker Chuck Hardwick, the leadership of Larry Weiss and then Assemblyman Doc Fillane and so many of the rest of you in the legislature, we were able, you see, to look beyond any immediate crises. We looked out and we invested in the long term. And look at what we have done together. In just eight years, for example, we have doubled we have doubled state spending on our schools, pouring more than $2 billion in new money. Today, we are number one. There is not a state in the continental United States in which taxpayers invest as much in our students. And when it comes to young people, we will take second place to no one. And we created a national model a groundbreaking welfare reform program, and then more than quadrupled our investment in just three years, and we gave welfare recipients the hand up they deserve today so that taxpayers won't have to give any handouts tomorrow. And we quadrupled the state and federal investment in infant care and nutrition so that the babies who are born today deep in our inner cities may live to experience that first day of kindergarten, the freedom of graduation, the joy of a, of a wedding day, and the elation of watching their own children enter this world healthy and safe and sound. And these aren't our only investments. We've doubled state aid to municipalities. We provided over $5 billion for transportation. And look at Medicaid over half a billion dollars in new money. In colleges and universities, over 400 million, plus another 35 million for scholarships. Again, all new money. And we have almost quadrupled our investment in community care for the retarded and the developmentally disabled. And in, almost three, in just three years, we have almost quadrupled our investment in education and treatment to finally rid our young people of the scourge of drug abuse. You see, to the single mother on welfare in Trenton, 
or the teenager who's struggling against drugs in Newark. We have sent a simple message we have in Trenton. We've said, your future is our future. We have borne the responsibility that government is so often accused of shirking. We have looked beyond the clamor of today, and we've looked outward to the calm of tomorrow. Yes, our state of New Jersey is a very good place in 1989, but because of you and because of the investments that you have made, New Jersey will be an even better place in 1999. That brings us to this new year, a year in which our new way of doing business will be tested as it has never been tested before. This year, as you know, state revenues are finally slowing. They no longer exceed estimates as they did for the past six years. So instead of investing surplus, we must look to cover shortfalls. And before I explain how I think we should proceed, I think we have to note a couple of things. First, by most indicators, our economy remains strong. Unemployment shows no sign whatsoever of rising. New businesses and workers continue to march across our borders. And let me say this, to those who believe the New Jersey decade is over, I say wait for Act Two. The best is yet to come. So what is wrong? Well, to be honest, we're not sure. You know the old saying that if you laid all the economists in the world end to end, they would never reach a conclusion? Well, our economists can't say definitely whether this slowdown in revenues is a natural result of a full employment economy, whether it's a temporary phenomenon caused by federal tax changes, or whether it is simply and maybe ominously an early warning of national economic problems to come. But these signs do exist, and the money does not. It would be foolish for us to ignore these facts. We must also note, by the way, however, that we are in better shape than many of our neighbors. We don't have to concoct uh, questionable borrowing schemes. We don't have to sunder our safety net. And we don't have to scurry through the dictionary to find euphemisms for major tax increase. But we still face challenges. And these are big challenges. The question before us in 1989 is whether at this first sign of rough water, we're going to trim our sails and turn back to the failed policies that sank our economy a decade ago, or whether we will sail ahead, knowing that just ahead, is another patch of calm water in front of these temporarily rough seas. Let me say this. As long as I am in command of this ship of state of New Jersey, the answer is simple. Full speed ahead. <laughs> this $12 billion budget I present to you today increases spending by under 2% over last year, well below the rate of inflation. This is the smallest increase in state spending since 1976, back when the Giants still played in New York, and Coke was only a soft drink, and Oliver North just another Marine. 58% of this budget is in local aid and grants. Another 20% of, of this budget is fixed costs that you and I can do nothing about. And the remainder is invested in pressing priorities such as prisons, colleges, and universities, and of course, the protection of our environment. If you're looking for an adjective to describe this budget, the one that applies is austere. Yes, we continue to invest in priorities. But we've had to weld our scalpel, and that scalpel is cut deep. We have sliced $89 million from last year's operating budgets. This year, 13 of our 19 departments will have to make do with less. 
Our philosophy is that government should sacrifice first so that New Jerseyans don't have to sacrifice later. Every dollar we cut is another dollar that we can invest. And no investment, I might say, to me, is more important than education. And that's why, while the rest of this budget grows by less than 2%, State aid to education will increase by 5%. Eight out of every $10 in increased spending in this budget goes right back to our schools. Today, New Jersey taxpayers invest on the average more than $8,000 on every student. That's more than the cost of a year at Rutgers, more than the cost of a great many good private schools. But frankly, let me say this. If there was more money available, I would provide even more for our schools. And I make a promise to you today, I will work with you in any way possible to see if we can find other sources of money to be put behind education and put into our schools. But having said that, remember, we have increased education spending by three times the rate of inflation since I took office. And local taxpayers have come right along and matched our investment. And I think maybe it's time for parents and taxpayers together to ask not just how much more money they can get, but rather how much more they can get for their money. It is not unfair to ask, after doubling school aid, after doubling it in the face of declining enrollment, should we ask whether our children are receiving an education that's twice as good as they received in 1982? I don't think it is wrong, while we try to provide every dollar we can from the state, to seek accountability from those who run our schools. There are other increases in this budget. There is more money for health care, for the poor. There is more money to upgrade our science and technology laboratories, for urban housing. There is more money to spread the benefits of welfare reform to the urban poor, particularly in Camden and Hudson and Essex counties. As you see, these investments eventually will be returned to our treasury. We can't afford not to make those investments in people in good times or in bad times, but again, these are the exceptions. As a rule, this is a no-growth budget. And I believe it is a very appropriate time, perhaps in some ways, to pause and look at our spending. The size of state government has grown considerably in recent years, as Washington has told us to do more on one hand, and local governments have said they could only do less. We have tried to respond ably and with imagination, but no organization, whether it's IBM or a corner newsstand can double its budget in eight years and guarantee that all that money is being spent well and efficiently. So our pause this year may be in the best interest of a species that, if not endangered, is certainly frequently under attack, and that's our New Jersey taxpayer. Cicero defined prudence as the knowledge of things to be sought and those to be shunned. We seek to share the fruits of our prosperity with every New Jerseyan, but we shun a return to the misbegotten policies of budget crises one after the other begetting tax increases that once made opportunity and prosperity impossible. Let me just take a quick look at history. This state relies on three main taxes, business, sales, and income. In 1966, we passed the sales tax. In 67, we increased business taxes. We increased taxes on business again in 1968, in 1972, in 1975, and in 1980. And we added an income tax in 1976 and raised it again in 1982. Now, you've heard of the Chinese and their year of the dragon. Well, New Jersey has had the decade of the tax increase. And now, finally, 
we have been able to at least temporarily slay this monster. And for the first time in over a quarter of a century, New Jerseyans have enjoyed a stretch of six years without an increase in the sales, income, or business taxes. And to me, it is no coincidence that this period has been the time of New Jersey's greatest prosperity. But with revenue slowing, I know we will hear the familiar refrain, raise the business tax or raise the sales tax or raise the income tax. I happen to believe we must resist these demands. The budget before you contains no long-term revenue enhancers, uh, no extensions of existing revenue sources. You don't have to read my lips. You can simply read the paper on which this budget is printed. This budget is balanced with no new taxes. So it is my spending blueprint. It's austere, and yet it allows us to continue, and in some cases even to expand our investments in everything from education to infant nutrition. And it does so without taking some, but sometimes easy way out and raising taxes. But I know today, as we sit here, there is another tax on your minds, and that's the property tax. So let me just talk with you about that for one moment. There seems to be some confusion about my position on the Slurp Commission's recommendations. Let me make myself clear. Some editorial writers believe, I guess, that I look at Slurp the same way that Michael Douglas looked at Glenn Close in that strange movie last year <laughs> as a mistake that I once made that I wish would just go away. The truth is, <laughs> the truth is, of course, that slip in my relationship is not a completely fatal attraction. <laughs> and I would take seriously this moment to salute the able men and women who devoted so much of their time to benefit the state. <laughs> I did criticize SLIP because I thought it only looked at new ways to increase taxes and not ways to reduce spending. SLIP proposed raising state taxes by a billion and a half dollars, a third of which would have to come from the income tax. Now, I just don't believe that the good people of New Jersey are undertaxed. I'm particularly concerned about an increase in the income tax. And let me tell you why. I believe that a large income tax increase could end the economic advantage that we now enjoy and turn, for many in this state, prosperity into poverty. But don't take my word for it. Look to the north in Massachusetts. The state faces budget deficits which dwarf our own by any measurement, and yet the governor says it would be unwise to consider any rise in the income tax. In New York, while recommending raising some taxes, a governor is insisting on moving ahead with plans to lower the income tax rates so they can get closer to ours. Now, these governors I'm talking about are not exactly profits of supply-side economics. But they know something. They know the New Jersey formula of trying to keep income taxes low creates jobs. Now, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But it would be the worst sort of false modesty, and I think misguided governance, to repay their attention by reversing our income tax stands. Let me make my point simply and vividly. Higher income taxes are a razor-sharp guillotine poised to descend on the bare neck of our prosperity. Let me be absolutely clear. I will oppose any income tax increase when it is debated, and I will veto any income tax increase if it is passed. But 
slurp is right in its efforts to bring down the property tax, so let me tell you what I can support. First, I have long believed that the state should take over the cost of administering welfare. If, if, <laughs> if we do this, we can save Camden County taxpayers $13 million, Essex County taxpayers $14 million, and taxpayers across this entire state almost $110 million a year. I support the state takeover of welfare to reduce the property tax. <laughs> Second, it is past time we took over the cost of the state court system. <laughs> we run the system we should pay for the system. We can save property taxpayers at least $145 million, so I support a state takeover of the court system. <laughs> and third, as I have often reminded you, New Jersey is not whole if Princeton prospers while Patterson suffers. The property tax problem is at its worst in our cities. So I would propose today we should add at least $65 million on top of our distressed cities program. I believe we should do so not only to make mayor's lives easier, which it will, but to create a permanent fund so that this money will be available in good times and in bad. And finally, you know, there was once a very good reason for mailing homestead rebate checks from Trenton. By sending them out, we earned federal dollars. That has been changed. That is not true anymore. So I think we should change the system and allow homeowners to deduct directly from their property taxes. And in the process, homeowners will see their property tax bills go down by $350 million a year, and the state can save a lot of money on administrative costs. Taken together, this program, even without the last thing I mentioned, would provide almost a third of a billion dollars in new property tax relief. And I believe we can support this relief without returning to the high tax policies of the 70s. To do this, I would support two changes. The Ford tax credit remains a reverse Robin Hood, giving little to the poor and lots to the rich. I have asked you again and again to repeal the Ford bill and I ask you to do so now and take that money and return it directly to the property taxpayer. And New Jersey should not continue to be the only state in the region in which when you go to a bar and order milk, you pay a tax. But you don't pay a tax in the same bar if you order a dry martini. We ought to begin doing what every other state in the region does, and that's tax liquor sales across the counter. <laughs> These two changes would support the entire property tax relief program that I've just outlined. But to make sure that the promise of property tax relief is equal to the rhetoric. I would ask you to lower the cap on county assessments by a dollar for every dollar we provide in tax relief. And because what is good for the goose is good for the gander, I would like to work this year finally with Senator John Russo and put an overall cap on state spending. I know that many of you feel this is difficult, it is an election year, but I also believe that gives us an opportunity 
It's the year we can start real property tax reform. We are the second richest state in the entire United States. We are not the state to turn our back on cities, on the renters, on the low and middle income homeowners, or on the elderly, all struggling to make their next property tax payment. We can reduce property taxes, and we can do it responsibly without hurting our state's economy. You see, budgets, after all, are not about numbers. We read numbers, but that's not what budgets are about. They're not about economic projections or even estimates. At their heart, budgets are about people. What we do here makes a difference. As in years past, I have invited three New Jerseyans to be with us today because they are people who have been affected by what we have done in past budgets, because they're people who have been helped by our actions, New Jersey and whose lives are better because we've been wise in our investments. Our first guest is a professor at Ramapo College. Like many of us, he's concerned that we are producing a generation of young people who are globally illiterate. He was troubled when a recent survey found that 75% of college-age students could not locate the Persian Gulf on a map, and fewer than half couldn't identify the United Kingdom or even Japan. This college professor decided to do something about it. With the help of a challenge grant that you approve, he began to make Ramapo the college of choice for American students who wanted to be globally literate. Today, Ramapo students learn foreign languages, they study international business, and through the miracle of telecommunications, they debate students in Japan, in the Netherlands, and around the world. Last year, a young Soviet woman visited the United States. She wired ahead to inform the sponsors of her trip that she wanted really to visit the centers of international learning. And she mentioned in the telegram four schools, Princeton, Harvard, Columbia, and Ramapo. <laughs> With our investment, this professor has helped put Ramapo on the map, and in doing so, he is helping to guarantee that America will have a place on the world's economic map in the 21st century. Please welcome Dr. Clifford Peterson of Harrington Park. Our second guest might qualify for a case study, I guess, in one of your courses at Ramapo. He's an entrepreneur, the owner of Senogenics Corporation, a small company in Morgansville that makes some of the world's most effective tests for diagnosing everything from pregnancy to colon cancer and a number of other medical conditions. This entrepreneur just has one date on his mind. It's January 1st, 1992. See, that's the day when 23 European countries will drop their trade barriers, opening up a market worth more than $500 trillion, a market larger than this entire United States. Our guest wants his company to be a player in that market. But alone, he and his workers simply don't stand a chance. Luckily, because of an investment you made, he has a helping hand. Through Ming Su and the Division of International Trade, he is attending trade shows and he's signing contracts with suppliers all the way across Europe. He's creating good jobs for people here in New Jersey. And at the same time, he's reducing our balance of payments. He says something. If you try to move into the European market in 1992, it'll be too late. But with our help, he is making his move and he's making his mark today. Meet Michael Katz of Morgan. Our third guest is only 19 years old, but already she's a pioneer. She's one of the first graduates of our REACH Welfare Reform Program. Two years ago, the future didn't look very bright for this young woman. She dropped out of high school. She was expecting a baby. 
and she had really no hope for a good job. Given that scenario, she expected to be on welfare for years. She needed a boost. And you, you and the legislature, you gave it to her. REACH changed her expectations. REACH helped to give her training. And today, she's employed as a receptionist at the law firm of Hughes, Henricks, and Wallace in West Trenton. And she's taken further advantage of that opportunity you've given her. Look at what she's done. She has only been at the job less than a year. Already, she has received one promotion and two raises. She is earning four times what she received on welfare. When this young woman began REACH, we had to help her with transportation. Today, we're proud to report she just bought her first car. And our 23-month-old son, Jeffrey, is in a good daycare center, and he has good health care benefits, both because of REACH. Today, the future looks so much brighter for this young woman and for her son and your investment, you. That's the reason why. So please welcome Kim Breast of Trenton. Kim, Michael, and Clifford, to me, offer vivid proof that we've built a New Jersey that is stronger, more confident, and yes, kinder than it was the decade before. We found the courage and the will to do what is right, not just for the next election, but for the next generation. Now, I know that political leaders love to say they're concerned only about the distant future. I remember a story I used to tell my students about Congressman Henry Clay who was once in a debate in Congress when a colleague ended a long, dull harangue by saying, you, Mr. Clay, speak for the present generation, while I speak only for posterity. Clay responded, yes, and you seem willing to keep on speaking until your audience arrives. <laughs> well, we have changed the focus of government in New Jersey, and today, I guess I simply ask you to keep it going. This tight budget obviously is not going to meet everyone's approval, and I'll work with you to make necessary changes. I know that all sorts of groups are going to demand more spending on their programs. Some groups are going to come to you and demand higher taxes. I ask you today, don't turn your backs on what we have already done together. Don't turn your backs on Clifford and Michael and Kim and all the other people who've been beneficiaries of what we've done two centuries ago. There was a man named Simon Bolivar, and he led a revolution in South America, freeing country after country from colonial rule. And the fight was intense, the struggle long. And once Bolivar was asked how long he would continue, how long can you keep this up? And he replied, we are now seeing the light. It is not our desire to ever again be thrust back into the darkness. We in New Jersey in recent years have seen what the light can do for people's lives and for their spirit. Today I say to you, we will not go back. We will never go back. New Jersey will never again be thrust into the darkness. Thank you and God bless you. So Governor Tom Kane concludes his eighth and final budget address before a special joint session of the New Jersey Legislature. The governor spoke for about oh, 35 minutes and his speech was interrupted 25 times by applause. I guess uh, the governor's spending program, as he announced, as his administration announced yesterday, is worth 12 point, not quite 12.1 billion dollars. And today he proposed about 320 million dollars worth of property tax rebates and corrections. Uh, of course, this is just the beginning of the governor's uh, budgetary process. <laughs>
John Russo up on stage there joking about the governor's proposal to tax people for uh, buying a drink across a bar when right now they're being taxed for uh, buying a glass of milk. Uh, this is only the beginning of the governor's budgetary process, of course. It still has to go through legislative hearings in both the uh, Senate and the Assembly. That process will be going on for approximately the next six months because the state has to have its ni fiscal 1990 budget in place by the end of June. That's our report here from the State Museum Auditorium. Let's go back to the studio now in Trenton and Phil Bremen.